Hey, before we get started today, we're giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. All you've got to do to enter to win is tell me what you think. I'm producer Andy Last, and it's time for my second annual Your Money, Your Wealth podcast survey. Just answer 15 questions about the YMYW podcast. Do it before August 18th, and I will randomly choose the winner of the $100 Amazon gift card to be announced in the podcast on August 20th. Head over to the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com now for the link to complete the survey. And thank you for helping us to make this your favorite podcast ever, and good luck. Now, Jonathan Clements from HumbleDollar.com returns to Your Money, Your Wealth today with some wise suggestions for our portfolios given the current market conditions and tax laws. Plus, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA answer your questions about Roths, rollovers, when to invest, and when to retire. But first, Joe, let's welcome Jonathan Clements. He's the founder of HumbleDollar.com, former personal finance writer for The Wall Street Journal, and the author of nine personal finance books, including his latest, From Here to financial happiness. Enrich your life in just 77 days. Jonathan Clements, thank you so much for joining us once again. Oh, thanks for having me on, Andy, Joe. It's great to be with you guys. Hey, it's, it's been more than 77 days since you've been on. <laughs> and I got to tell you, my life is fully enriched with financial happiness thanks to you. <laughs> Anything I can do to make your financial life happier, Joe. <laughs> hey, with with the markets, you know, it seems like this bull market is not going to stop anytime soon. And you just wrote a really good article at Humble Dollar. What are some of your thoughts about, you know, the last 10 years, markets doing well. People are saying markets all-time highs. Do I get out? Do I keep some chips off the table? What should I do? Should I buy more? I mean, what are some of your thoughts around giving people the right advice, given kind of this unique market environment that we've experienced? Well, I think we all need to start with three crucial words. I don't know. None of us know what is going to happen next in the financial markets. Just because we've had 10 years of generally rising stock prices doesn't mean we're going to suddenly have a big drop. Just because valuations are very high doesn't mean share prices are going to decline. There is no way to forecast what's going to happen next in the financial market. So don't try to predict the markets. Instead, instead, what you should do is manage risk, because managing risk is something we can actually control. And in this particular article you're referencing, Joe, what I talk about is not just rebalancing your portfolio. That's when you've have some allocation to stocks and bonds. You've got target weights for each, and you periodically rebalance back to those target weights. Right now, that would cause you to sell some of your stocks and add your bonds. Instead, what I'm talking about in this article is rebalancing back to whatever your target amount is for retirement. So let's say you have a number in your head for how much you need to retire in comfort. And thanks to the last 10 years, you are well on track to hit that target. Well, maybe you say to yourself, okay, instead of being greedy and trying to have even more, maybe what I should do is change my mix of stocks and bonds to one that's more likely to get me to that target number. And after the last 10 years, that might mean a target asset allocation that actually has somewhat less in stocks and somewhat more in bonds, which means that if indeed we do get a big market decline, you're going to be in much better shape. So walk me through that exercise. So let's say I want to retire in 15 years. And I guess the first step of all of this is really identifying my goals or, or what my lifestyle is going to look like and then figuring out, all right, well, if I want to spend, let's just assume it's $100,000 just to keep the math simple. I would start there and say, that's what I want to spend. Secondly, I would have to start looking at what my fixed income sources are, maybe Social Security, pensions, maybe real estate income, and subtract that from the goal. So maybe I have $50,000 of fixed income, so I'm short 50. So that's what has to come from my portfolio. How would I start now calculating, you know, here's where I'm at now. In 15 years, how much should I be saving or what my portfolio should be looking like to reach that target goal? So it's going to be a rough and ready calculation. It always is when you're oh, dealing yeah, with yeah, financial yeah. Oh, for sure. But you start by saying, okay, I want to get... $50,000 out of my portfolio in, we're saying, 15 years. Sure. So 15 years from now, 
to generate $50,000, you're going to need one and a quarter million dollars using a 4% portfolio withdrawal rate. And so the sort of flip side of that or the reverse of that is you take how much income you want, you multiply it by 25, and that'll give you the sum you need in today's dollars. Remember, we're ignoring inflation here that you'll need to generate that income. So your goal is a one and a quarter million dollars. Then you figure out where you are today. Let's say you've got half a million dollars saved currently. Let's imagine that over the next 15 years, you're going to save in current dollars, say $20,000 a year. So you can go on the web. There are so many of these financial calculators out there. You put in your starting sum, you put in how much you save, and then you can have to make some return assumptions. And I say to people these days, you know, you can expect something like a 4% real rate of return from a global stock portfolio. And from a bond portfolio, you might, you might get about 1% a year after inflation. So you figure out what mix of stocks and bonds you got. You allocate 4% to the stocks, 1% to the bonds. You get a blended rate of return. You throw that into the financial calculator and you see, are you going to hit that one and a quarter million dollars? Are you going to be way above it? If you're way above it, that means that perhaps you want to think about dialing back the risk level a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Um, w- with what you're seeing in the article, it's like, all right, well, you know, I think people rebalance. But if we're and, – and, you know, it's really good too, Jonathan. I know I'm going to go on a bunch of tangents with you here. But it's it's really good to read something. And it's like maybe tone this thing down. Don't be so greedy versus hearing like, oh, my God, you know, the, the financial crisis. Everyone is going to retire uh, in the streets on bread lines and everyone's broke. You know, it's like that whole fear mongrel drives me nuts where yours is giving really good practical advice to everyday Joe. It's like, all right, well, here, let's not be greedy. Let's take a look at your portfolio, do a little bit of planning and making sure that that money's there. Because if the market drops half, now you're not where you want to be. And let's just be prudent with the dollars that you've saved. And of course, at this point in the market cycle, 10 years into the bull market, this is not what people want to do. It's actually getting to the point where it's really driving me nuts. I mean, people are saying to me over and over again, oh, stocks are the only place to be. And not only are stocks the only place to be, but actually U.S. stocks are, are the only place to be. And in fact, not only U.S. stocks, but actually this select group of big tech companies are the, the only fang stocks. stocks. Yep. Yeah, the fang stocks. Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and so on are just an obsession all good things come to an end. And this is why we diversify. We know what has happened in the past, but we don't know what future we're going to get. And there are a whole array of possibilities. And one of those possibilities is a world where the FANG stocks do really, really badly. And you don't want your retirement to come unhinged because you made that one big massive bet. As I say to people, all the time. We get just one shot at making the financial journey from here to retirement. And you don't want to screw it up. You don't want to bet so heavily on one part of the market that you end up blowing up this beautiful retirement that you were hoping for. Yeah, with this 10-year run-up, we've just had so many people that are looking at it from a greedy standpoint of how much money can I possibly make rather than how much do I really need and take as little risk as possible to get to that point. One of the... uh, concepts that is so alien in America, and yet it's so crucially important, is the notion of enough. We all need to figure out what is enough. What is your number that will make for a comfortable retirement? And once you know that number, you should aim for it. You shouldn't be constantly aiming for more, 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 because that is likely to end up with you having a whole lot less. (laughs) You know, we could have the best laid out plans but it just seems like our minds are not wired appropriately to deal with our own money. Absolutely. We all suffer from recency bias. We're all incredibly influenced by what's happened in the last couple of years. I mean, go back to what you're talking about, Joe, during the Great Recession, during that collapse in stock prices between 2007 and 2009. People thought the end of the world was coming. And today... Today, we're actually talking about going to the moon again. It's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 um, 
I, I do a lot of public speaking. I was at an event last night, and I was talking to the group, and it's like, all right, you know the market is going to crash, right? It's going to correct at some point. And then everyone, oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, we know it's going to happen. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do? And then, of course, what does everyone say? Oh, we're going to buy. You know, we're going to hold our course because we have the right portfolio and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you're just lying to yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you're doing. You know, it's like, you know, it, it, in 2008 and 9, I mean, it was really scary stuff. I mean, you know, we lived it and being in the business and, and living and breathing it. I mean, that is, it's scary. And then, you know, you look, what, 10 years later and how big of a run that the market has. No one would ever have predicted this. And the greed comes back or our memories are short. And it's like, oh, well, you know, now I know how to handle it. I was like, baloney. <laughs> Ten years is, uh, you know, it's a short time, but it's also, uh, it's an eternity. So. Yeah, if somebody wants a reality check, if they still have the records, if they could go online and find them, see what you actually did in late 2008 and early 2009. Did you buy? Did you just sit tight? Did you sell? Because however you behaved in 2008 and early 2009, that is the best indication of how you're going to behave next time around. And if you were a seller in late 2008 and early 2009, I can guarantee you that you will be freaked out the next time the market declines. And probably taking a few chips off the table would not be a bad thing to do. You know, I wish there was something that could trigger an emotion with that. Um, for instance, I um, someone sent me a picture of myself aged 40 years. So I looked like I oh, was Oh, they like, did the face app thing to you. Yeah, that face app okay. thing. Have you seen that, Jonathan? Those face yeah, apps? Yeah, no. The, actually, I, I think it's a brilliant piece of technology, and there's been some interesting studies around that because what they found is if we take people and we age their faces like that, we show people what they're going to look like in the future, it creates sympathy for our future self. And so by doing that, it actually prompts people to be – bigger savers, to eat more healthily, to go to the gym more often. That aging technology is really super effective. So, Joe, what did it do for yeah, you? No, it's, it worked on me. It's like, what the hell's going on here? Save, you know, and increase my savings or just, you know, I'm eating salads <laughs> Got to take care of this old day. man. <laughs> and, but I was a very handsome old man, I got to tell you. I was extremely handsome. So I was like, yeah, what the hell? You know, I'll just keep drinking beers during the weekend, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, but that really had an emotional effect on me, seeing your older self, right? You want to take care of the old guy. Mm -hmm. I wish we could have something that could trigger that emotion when it comes to market volatility. Because, I mean, we've seen the stress tests before, and it's like, well, this is what would happen if your portfolio, you know, dropped 30%. Here's the real number. And people kind of look at that, and they're like, oh, yeah, okay. But they know it's not real. Because you can't see yourself, you know, broke or, you know, spending less or saving more or feeling that anxiety. Because when I saw the picture of my older self, I felt something. When I see my portfolio down 30% in a fake Monte Carlo or a stress test or something like that, I mean, I see it, I feel it a little bit, but it, I don't know if it can really help my financial behavior. So like Jonathan said, the thing that really matters is what you did in 2008 and 9. That's the true test of your risk tolerance. Right, exactly. So what do you think? Is it time to reduce the risk in your investment portfolio? We happen to have a calculator for you, very much like the one that Jonathan Clements mentioned earlier. Check the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com, and you can download Big Al's Quick Retirement Calculator and find out if you're on track for retirement. For an even deeper dive on the topic of risk, I've also included links to additional resources that delve into what risk management is, eight risks that can derail your retirement, different types of risk management, and why it's important to manage risk. Those are all in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com, along with the transcript of this interview and links to our previous conversations with Jonathan Clements. Hey, Jonathan, are you going to do a conversion this year? What's the story? You kind of kept me hanging here. Yeah, so uh, this was the, the other article that uh, we wanted to talk about today, about this opportunity to do a, a big Roth conversion. And this goes back to the 2017 tax law. And what that 2017 tax law did was it really stretched out 
the tax brackets. And let me explain what I mean by that. If you're a couple married, filing jointly in 2017, before the new tax law was passed, once you had something around $100,000 in total income, you started to get taxed at 25%. Under the current tax law, you can have income of up to $350,000 or thereabouts as a couple married filing jointly and still be taxed at 24% or less. That's how much flatter the tax brackets are today than they were just a couple of years ago. But this is potentially a limited time opportunity. The 2017 tax law, at least as it relates to individuals, most of those provisions sunset at the end of 2025, which means that in 2026, we're going back to 2017's tax law unless Congress acts. And it's entirely possible that we may go back earlier, depending on what happens in the next election. So if you're thinking about doing a big conversion from your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, there is this window of opportunity right now to do that conversion, convert a relatively large sum, and get taxed at a relatively low rate. And so, yeah, this is something that I've been thinking about, and a lot of people I've been talking to have been thinking about as well. This is really an interesting time to contemplate that conversion, and I think I will do a significant conversion this year and probably next year as well. You know, it's crazy how big those brackets are. The top of the 24, as you mentioned, as a married couple, you know, 300 some odd thousand dollars last year, or I guess two years ago now, in 2017, that would have been in the 28 and most likely in alternative minimum tax, where your effective rate is 35%. And we live in the state of California here, so add another 10% on top of that, 45% tax, where you can get at 24 you know, versus 35, I mean, that is a significant savings um, for anyone, you know, really taking a look at this. I mean, if you're in the 10, 12, 22, or 24 percent tax brackets, I think that is the sweet zone for some people to at least maybe glance at it to see if it makes sense for them. Yeah, so I don't want to scare people off. I mean, we already talked about using financial calculators earlier in this discussion, but I'm going to bring it up again. What you should do is look at where you stand today, how much you're going to save in the years ahead, and try to get some sense for how much money you might have once you get into your 70s. You have to take what are called required minimum distributions from your retirement accounts, because that's when a lot of retirees start to pay taxes at a surprisingly steep rate. So if you do those projections and you're saying, heck, you know, when I get into my 70s, I could easily be taxed at 25 percent or more, especially if we go back to the old tax law, then there is an incentive to do a Roth conversion today. If, on the other hand, you're still going to be in a pretty low tax rate, then maybe the Roth conversion doesn't make any sense because you'll just end up paying taxes at a higher rate today than you would down the road. You know, there's a lot of benefits when it comes to at least, you know, looking at this. Tax diversification is a big topic we talk on this show often because, as you've seen, Jonathan, a bulk of the mass affluence savings are in retirement accounts. And, you know, they've done what they told and maxed out the 401k plans as much as they could. And now they're accumulating a quite a bit of dollars in here. And then once they retire, that's this notion of that will always be in a lower tax bracket. And I think that's true for most because uh, most people haven't necessarily saved enough. But on the other side of the coin, the people that listen to shows like this or read your books, they've saved a couple of bucks. And it's like, well, now everything is coming out of a retirement account taxed at ordinary income rates. They're kind of shocked, actually, that they're in the same bracket or in, in some cases a higher bracket just to the fact that they did a lot of savings. And so one of the reasons to do a Roth conversion on top of everything else, if you can do it in your 50s or even earlier, one of the things that you can potentially avoid down the road is when you start to draw down those retirement accounts, they can actually end up raising your Medicare premiums because those withdrawals at your income, the higher your income is, the higher your Medicare premiums are going to be. So by converting now, you may be able to save yourself that surcharge later on. So much great information. As always, it's Mr. Jonathan Clements, the founder of HumbleDollar.com and the author of nine personal finance books. His latest is From Here to Financial Happiness. Enrich your life in just 77 days. And of course, you can get that at HumbleDollar.com. Jonathan Clements, thank you so much for joining us again today. 
It's my pleasure, Andy. Thanks for having me on, Joe. That's Jonathan Clements, everyone. Check him out at HumbleDollar.com. What do we got here? We've got Ed from Iowa. All right. Ed says, do you have a Your Money, Your Wealth show blog or article that addresses how and when to get into the markets? <laughs> no. Nope. For instance, right now, if one has cash and wants to move into a conservative fund, but the markets are at near all-time highs, what is a common-sense approach? He's not asking for advice. Just wants to see a discussion around the issue if you have one. We do. We actually really talked to Jonathan Jonathan Clements. 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 So Ed, about when to get into the market? But markets are near. You know, what's the most common sense approach? Two things to think about here. Um, you could dollar cost average, Ed, but you first figure out what what type of portfolio do you need? You know, what is your time frame? Do you, I mean, do you need the money next week, or is it like in 20, 30 years? How old is that? I don't know. So don't think of it like, all right, well, markets are all-time highs. In 20 years from now, do you think markets are going to be higher than they are today? I think probably so. Right. So then don't even sweat it. But invest. Get in, the, in now and put it in yes. there and Invest in the go. appropriate portfolio that you need for your overall goals. But if, if you want to go back and listen to Jonathan, he was stating this. It's like, okay, well, let's just say that you're invested in a certain strategy – but maybe you don't necessarily be – maybe changing strategy might be more appropriate mm-hmm. because markets are a little – Frothy. Peakish. <laughs> frothy. Um, right? And so it's like, all right, well, maybe I go into a conservative fund. Maybe I change because now it's like in what target rate of return do I need to generate? Is it 4%? Is it 6%? Is it 2%? You know, build that portfolio based on what your goals are and what target rate of return – that, that, that you're looking to anticipate. And take as little risk as you need. Yeah, and then and invest right now. Um, another way to do is dollar cost average. So put in, you know, $1,000 a, you know, or one twelfth of the portfolio in each month for the next 12 months. Studies have found over and over again that that um, helps people with emotional issues. Um, Behavioral finance, right? Not emotional issues yes, like they're. That's you know, an but. emotional issue. <laughs> Behavioral finance is very emotional. But if you just invest, just do it. Read the transcript of our interview with Jonathan Clements and find links to his website, his latest book, From Here to Financial Happiness. Hear his previous appearances on YMYW. And you can also share this podcast and subscribe all in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. You can listen to brand new episodes on demand as soon as they're released. Or, you know, if you're new to YMYW, you can just binge all our old episodes to get caught up. Now it's time for some more of your money questions. Click Ask Joe and Al on air at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and send those questions in as a voice message or as an email. Can you imagine binging this? If we got an email this? from somebody who did. He said he listened to 40 of our podcast episodes, like, back to back. Yeah, that was Jay from Chicago. 40! He said, uh, Jay, what is wrong said, with you? Hi, <laughs> hi, Joe and Big Al. I just discovered your show last week, and I blasted through about 40 podcast episodes since. Blast. <laughs> last week, <laughs> Jay? Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> He lives in Chicago? I'm going to buy that guy a beer. <laughs> I would say we don't recommend that, but if you, if, if you want to, sure. Yeah. Uh, Michelle from <laughs> Illinois. She, she, <laughs> she, she, she writes in, <clears throat> um, my husband, uh, 51, and I, 49, have uh, $4.5 million saved for retirement, 401k, pension, IRA, CD, and savings. Uh, we would like to retire in five years with an annual income of one hundred thousand dollars for the first five years, and then around sixty-five thousand thereafter. We would like to travel abroad once a year for the first five years, uh, with travels in the U.S. afterwards. Uh, so that's probably the difference, bud. Right between the hundred. That's what I'm guessing. Okay. Yeah. Yep. We will have to pay for our own health insurance. Uh, both of us have some medical issues. Uh, but what we do not have a mortgage or any loans. We have no children and do not plan to leave an inheritance. All right, uh, question. Number one, <clears throat> do you feel this is possible? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer and, and is. We'll, and, and we'll tell you why, Michelle. So if you have $4.5 million saved right now, which is great, congratulations. At and 51 and 49. Right. And, and you have another five years to be saving and having compound interest, and, and that could be worth 
five million, six million. Let's just say five million. We'll yeah. be conservative. Yep. Okay. Okay. So then you use the four percent rule. Four percent of five million dollars is two hundred thousand dollars. Would be roughly what you could draw from that. Now yeah, you're, I mean at fifty five, let's just now, say now it's you're two percent. Now you're younger, so maybe it's you know or or three. Yep. Yeah. Even three percent would be one fifty. Two percent would be a hundred thousand, which is. What they want for the that, first five years, yeah. and then sixty-five thereafter. Sixty-five thereafter, and so. then at age sixty-five, Social Security is going to come in. Yep. And with the savings that they have, um, the only thing that I need to know about Michelle and her husband um, is how much money they have in four hundred one k. They say pension. Is that a lump sum pension, or is that going to be an income stream pension? Sure. Because she's saying four and a half million. Um, I'm not sure what that is. CDs and savings. Is that CDs and savings in the retirement account, or is it outside? How much is outside? How much is inside? Um, I think the four and a half million is combined between the four hundred one k. Yeah, pension, I know, the I know. The well, but what I'm, but what I need to know is that four. I understand how the four and a half is combined. How it would, yeah, how yeah. it's how it's separated. Yeah, something else I would consider, Michelle, is if you retire in five years, uh, your husband will be fifty six, you will be fifty four. I don't know who has the four hundred one k. Maybe both of you. Now, if you retire at age 55 and older, then you have access to those dollars. Uh, you can pull them out without penalty. This is something that not a lot of people know because they're thinking 59 and a half, which is the IRA rule. So here's the rule. If you're 55 and older, when you separate from service from your existing active 401k, you can start pulling dollars out. And of course you pay income taxes, but there's no penalty. So now if you are 54, when you retire, then you would not have that ability to do that with your 401k. So you might want to wait till 55 just for that reason, depending upon how much you have in your 401k, if, in fact, you're planning on drawing from that. Um, and then, of course, i got to read question number two. I should sure. have probably read the question before I started talking. Uh, we both have Roths that we are contributing to early in our careers um, until we reach the income cutoff. Our savings are pretty balanced between pre and after tax. So I guess half of the four and a half is outside of retirement accounts, half of There you go. Right. um, Do you recommend contributing to a Roth IRA? Thank you very much for your recommendations. Um, Michelle, we don't give recommendations (laughs) on this program. (laughs) We give ideas. Yes. Thoughts. We're just two guys chatting. Yeah, just, you know, just sitting at a bar stool. (laughs) This is what Al does. (laughs) <laughs> Sitting at a bar still talking about... Talking about taxes. <laughs> taxes and, and investments. 401ks. And <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> With a spritzer. Is it 5 o'clock um, <laughs> somewhere? <laughs> Me, on the other hand... I'm not what do you do on the bar still? Um, I'm not talking about... 401ks. 401ks. I'm usually having a course like talking probably about sports. Sports. That's your go-to? Or it's something else that or I probably should Or asking somebody if they're a hugger. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey... Do you, do, you, do you like hugs? <laughs> is that your opening line? Yeah, that, that's that's pretty is that, good, isn't is it? Is that why you're still single? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, all right. Well. So I'm guessing, yes, I don't know how much Michelle makes or her husband makes, but I'm guessing it's a it's a pretty good amount because they're over the cutoff, right? So it's over $200,000 of EGI. Uh, they got four and a half million dollars saved. Half it's in retirement accounts. So if someone at fifty years old has two point two million dollars in retirement accounts, that tells me just simple math that they've been maxing out their four hundred one k plans for probably the last twenty some odd years. Right. Right. And if they have two and a half million outside, they either inherited, saved it, stock options, you know, small business owners. Right. Sure. I'm guessing that they probably have options of some sort. They had RSUs. They probably worked in high tech. I don't know Chicago. What's yeah? There's high tech there. That that would be a, a good. Guess. I'm guessing. That'd I don't be... know Michelle from anything. Yeah, but that's. I mean, that's. But a, that's, that's a, a pattern that we see right. often. Or sometimes people max fund their retirement, and then they inherit a bunch of money. Yep. So that could be too. And so, um, should she go with a Roth? You know, you got a little bit of money in Roth. It sounds like I don't. Because you have half your money outside of retirement accounts and you're going to retire in five years at 55, I would convert 
I would wait. I don't think you need to contribute to the Roth. I mean, what's 6000 bucks? Who cares? Well, how can they contribute if they're past the income cutoff? I'm just saying maybe you could, they could do backdoor IRA yeah. contributions. Yeah. And then, you know. But, but if, I would wait five years and then do, do conversions because your income is going to be so low because they could live off of the non-retirement accounts. And if they structure that properly, they could keep themselves in a zero Possibly zero percent tax bracket, right? And then onto that two and a half million from age fifty five to seventy, they could slowly convert a lot of that money out and pay very little tax yeah, along the way. I I agree with that, especially because they can live off their non qualified or non retirement assets, yep. so keep their income low after retirement, and then they can be converting quite a bit. Now, it, Roth contribution, if you qualify, which for married, you have to have income below $193,000, joint income. There's a phase out between that and 203000 If you're below that, then by all means, go ahead and do two Roth contributions. That's that's a no-brainer. Uh, $7,000 for your husband, $6,000 for you, because you're not 50, Michelle. If, if they got um, Roth 401k, Options? I, I don't know what a tax bracket it, it is, depend, so yeah, it depends, right? depends on that. The, the fact that they want to retire young and can keep their income low, that's probably the smarter idea is to do conversions. Back to a Roth, uh, if you have other IRAs, doesn't work very well. But if you have no, if one of the two of you doesn't have an IRA, then you, you could do a back to a Roth. You go ahead and do a Roth. You do an IRA contribution, and then you convert that. Or if one of you has a small IRA, you could convert that to open up the backdoor Roth. So there's a few things you can do. But I think the the bigger picture, the way to look at this is just what you said, is is upon retirement, live off your non-retirement assets and then do Roth conversions at that point. Read our blog on the backdoor Roth IRA strategy in the show notes for today's episode at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And hey, did you realize that Your Money, Your Wealth is not only a podcast, it is also a weekly half-hour TV show completely different from the podcast. This week, Joe and Big Al discuss charitable giving that gives back on the YMYW TV show. And you can watch that for free and on demand at yourmoneyyourwealth.com too. Now let's get back to your money questions. If you've got one, click Ask Joe and Al on air at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and send it in as a voice message or as an email. Yeah, we got Jay from Chicago. We talked about him earlier in the show, but we never really answered his email question. Okay. He goes, hi, Joe and Big Al. I just discovered your show last week and have blasted through about 40 podcast episodes since. <laughs> in, in a week. Yeah. Thank you for the great content. <clears throat> My dad is 66 and has not saved adequately at all. He is self-employed and has no retirement accounts. He and his girlfriend, though, well, good for him. Look at that. Uh, together make about a median household income. Okay. I don't know what that is, but it's average. Sure. <laughs> or it's less than average. It's, it's about. <laughs> it's about. It's close. <laughs> he just started collecting Social Security. Uh, she is 62. They live in Florida. My question is this. If I were able to get him to start investing, or if I were to loan him some money in an investment account, what type of account would make the most sense? I was thinking about putting $7,000 into a Roth IRA, but wasn't sure what distribution rules would apply or if a non-taxable advantage account would make more sense. He's healthy enough that I think he should build whatever nest egg we can. Okay. Well, Jay, good for you, brother. That's very uh, thoughtful of you. It is. Um, they have a medium income, so he could put money into a Roth IRA if that median income is earned income. Yeah, I think that's the key to the question, right? It is uh, Jay, your dad has to be working, has to have earned income, has to have a job, has to have a job generating $7,000 of income for you to be able to put $7,000 into a Roth for him. But otherwise, if that's true, yes, you can. And that is the best place to put the money because it's tax-free. Yeah, so if you're going to give him seven thousand bucks, you put it into Roth. Um, well, he's self-employed. It says right here, and has no retirement account. So if he's self-employed, is and if he makes seven grand, you know, then you could put seven thousand dollars into the Roth IRA. But so still, he, and he's also collecting Social Security. So anything that he's making, hopefully, is under that sixteen, seventeen thousand dollar limit. Otherwise, he's giving some back. Well, I don't know if he's full. He's sixty-six, he's 66. so he's full retirement. So he's full retirement. Age. Age. So, yeah. so yep. it's no big okay. deal. He's well, okay. He's okay for now, but. 
we have seen lots of self-employed people that don't make any money. Yes. So I'm not my saying my father was one of them. I'm not saying <laughs> Jay's dad is one, but yeah. I'm just saying that. And so, then there's a suitcase of cash so, somewhere buried in the backyard. <laughs> Still haven't found it. That's why you go back every yeah, summer right. when it's the snow thaws. <laughs> <laughs> Big shovel. Yes. You got well, acre yeah. after acre just digging up. Di- just digging up. Anyway, I had some great point to say, but I forgot. Well, self-employed, because they, he could have expenses and things like that, income expenses, and then it might net out, and then his profits might be uh, yeah, yeah. lower so, than the 7000 so, so, that we're going? Yeah, well, I, was, I was going to say self-employment income is considered earned income. So that's why we're sort of going down this path. So you look at his, his gross income, call it $20,000, and ex, his expenses of 18000 In that case, there's $2,000 of profit, so that's $2,000 subject to self-employment tax, which means, Jay, you could put $2,000 into a Roth. So it's the lower of $7,000 or the earned income, whichever is lower. So you'd um, want to look at his tax return. Um, but, yeah, you could definitely um, – Contribute to a Roth at any age. The, the the distribution on Roth, there there is no distribution rules basically unless you take the money out prior to five years. That's the really only kind of quirky rule that they have because it's tax free as long as the money seasons for five years or you're fifty nine and a half. He's sixty six. You put seven thousand dollars into it. He has full access to the seven thousand dollars that you would put in, but let's say that seven thousand grows to ten, that three thousand dollars of earnings then would have the season for five years until. Um, so each year that you make those contributions, the five year clock would be satisfied the year that you you, you first make that contribution. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a key point and a misunderstood point, which is when you do a Roth contribution, that's the 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 $6,000 or $7,000 if you're 50 and older for 2019, when you put that contribution in, you can take it out anytime, any age, for any reason, at any, you know, next day. You don't have to wait five years. That's on the contribution. But if that contribution grows a dollar because of growth or income or whatever, that dollar has to stay in for five years. If you take the dollar out, then it's, it's still, you don't pay tax on it because it's in a Roth, but you have to pay a penalty, 10% penalty. And tax. And tax? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I got that wrong. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Th- That's why I'm here, Thanks buddy. for correcting me. Yeah, you got it. It's the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, San Diego. Hello. I'm 60 years old with a disability and retiring this year. I was wondering if I should roll my 401k into an IRA or Roth IRA. I have about $42,000 in the IRA. I would appreciate your feedback. All righty. <clears throat> Julia. We might need to need uh, to get a little more information. Just a smidge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just a smidge. We need to know your taxable income, Julia. Are you married? Are you single? Um, how much money did you make this year? Um, that's going to determine if you put the money into an IRA or Roth IRA. $42,000. Um, you're 60 years old. You don't have to take a required distribution until age 70. The required distribution on forty-two thousand. Let's say that thing grows to eighty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars by the time you're seventy. Your required distribution's four thousand bucks. It's not going to kill you tax-wise there either. So does it make sense to put it into a Roth or a traditional? Um, you know, it's it, it if if we had a, a little bit more information. Either way, I don't think it's going to hurt you. I would not do the forty-two thousand dollars all in one year into the Roth. I would probably break it up in 10 years into the Roth, slowly do it if you don't need the money. If you need the money, I would just keep it in, you know, from the 401k, I would definitely roll it into an IRA, but I don't know about the, the Roth and that. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. The 401k, yeah, the first step is to roll it to an IRA and then each year determine like what tax bracket you're in. Like let, let's, I, I don't know if you're married or single, but let's pretend you're single. And so the top of the 12% bracket is about 38000 So let's say when you look at your tax return, your taxable income is 30000 just as an example. So that means you could have converted $8,000 and still stayed in that 12% bracket. You probably don't want to do any more than that because then you go to the 22% bracket, so your tax is 10% higher. So that's one example. On the other hand, maybe you're married and, and you and your spouse make 500000 Then it's completely different advice. It, it just depends on the circumstance. So, so basically, to answer the question, we kind of need to know if you're married or single, how much income you're making, how much other 
fixed income you're going to have in retirement? Are you working right now? All these kinds of things. How and much money do you want to live off of? Right. Do you need the what, forty-two what, thousand? What you want ta- to give it to another, you know, spouse? Yeah. I mean, uh, give it to a, another beneficiary down the road. Yeah. What what tax bracket are you in now versus retirement? All that sort of stuff. So, <clears throat> sorry, it wasn't as cut and dry. Well, I think we told her to roll it to an IRA and then slowly, slowly start converting it. Yes. And possibly, depending upon her circumstances. I would not go higher than the 12% tax bracket. Yeah. And but let, let's another start. thing that could blow her up, though, let's just say that she's got Social Security disability, and then the Social Security disability is tax-free. Then she does a conversion, and all of a sudden the Social Security disability now is taxable. Yeah, good point. And then now you're not at 12%. You could be at, what, 24 and a half or whatever right. the, the stupid numbers That's work out. That's good point. So you yep. probably don't want to do a thing. Right. Just, so, just go to the IRA it, I mean, only. it gets tricky because they hear this stuff that we talk about. And it's like, okay, well, this one strategy is probably going to make sense for me because I really like tax-free. But then they do it, and it completely blows them up. And then other people, you know, they listen, ah, that's not for me, and it's absolutely for them. So it's it's always a case-by-case. Case. We got a compliment and a complaint. We got James from San Diego. Um, hi, Joe and Al. Uh, following up to my question a couple weeks ago, Actually, as soon as I sent my previous question, I then realized I had inadvertently neglected to express my appreciation for your podcast. Do you remember this? You said to James, hey, what, no love the show, nothing from you? Come on, what the heck? So he's getting back to you here. Each week, I look forward to enjoying your humorous and informative show. I appreciate you sharing your time, knowledge, and enthusiasm. Keep up the good work. Love your show. Are we good now, Joe? Uh, James, <laughs> we are always good. We are always good. Um, I appreciate that. And keep writing in. Keep listening. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, this comes from Portia. Portia from San Diego. Um, I would like to suggest that Joe Anderson might want to review his style on TV. I agree, Joe. <laughs> I know he is excited about his subject matter when he is talking. Sometimes he talks a little too fast and loudly, and it might turn off viewers. I hope you might suggest this to him in a positive way that you can in order a uh, positive way that you can in order to help viewers understand him more. Portia, thank you very much for that. I, I don't think this is what she had in mind of <laughs> you coaching me. <laughs> on my TV style. Hey, we got a complaint. Let's read it on the air. <laughs> I don't know what the heck she's talking about. Well, he, she's right. You you get very excited about your content. And I've seen the outtakes of the show, and, and it, it, it's even worse than what actually makes it to air. So, Portia, we actually do dial Joe down for the TV show. I, I don't, yeah. It's like, I don't, I, I, I find myself um, very melancholy and... <laughs> Really? I, yes, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, Portia, this stuff is boring as all get out, right? It's and so I try to spice it up, and I'm very passionate about what I do. So, if you want me to chill out a little bit, I think that's what she's saying. In, in, well, uh, but I she wants to down. say it. She wants to say it in a nice, nice way, in a positive way, so yeah. people understand what the hell I'm talking right, about. Exactly. Maybe I don't want people to understand what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> And thus, that is the whole crux of your money, your wealth. Yeah, there it is. So, <laughs> hey, if you got a compliment, if you got a complaint, uh, please share it um, with us because I would love to talk about it on the air. It gives um, I already have a self esteem problem, and it really helps when when I <laughs> when I hear this kind of stuff. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for Andy Lass for a great job, and uh, Clopine did a wonderful job as well. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. The show's called Your Money or Wealth. Special thanks to today's guest, Jonathan Clements. Find links to his website, HumbleDollar.com. Purchase his latest book, From Here to Financial Happiness. Listen to his previous appearances on YMYW. And you can also share this podcast and subscribe in the podcast show notes at YourMoneyYourWealth.com. While you're there, be sure to fill out my 2019 podcast survey before August 18th for your chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. We got a short derail for you, so stick around for that to the end. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. 
for your free two-meeting financial assessment with a certified financial planner, just click the free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. You know, um, I'm thinking actually more about the dried mangoes. I just they, you know, they stick in your teeth. Yes, they do. I'm having trouble talking. Yes, I'll try to get over it. It's um, yeah, jaw workout. <laughs> you say the and what, <laughs> during the break, right? You know, I got my hair cut, and yeah, give me a little shampoo. Yeah, know, right. Sure. I don't really like people touching me. You don't? Not necessarily. And okay. then this girl or lady. Give me a like a, a massage on my jaw. Really? <laughs> was that as a part of your haircut? Yes. Isn't that weird? That's uh, weird. Right? It's like she was like rubbing my like ears well, and head. You, sometimes you get a temple massage. No, she went down she, to my jaw. She went to the jaw. Oh, jawbone. And I was like, this is kind of <laughs> kind of awkward. Did you like it? I, I think I did. <laughs> So you got to go back? I might. I might. <laughs> wow. I, I don't think I've ever had a job massage, well, except with the mangoes. Yeah. Oh, boy. 